Hi patrons, welcome to part 3 of the how to draw fur tutorial. So this tutorial is going to be how to draw um, wavy light fur. So you can decide how sort of dark you want to go with this fur. So you can go very very beige or sort of keep it to the very light um, brownish sort of tones if you'd like. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the sculpting tool and we're going to etch that pattern into the paper. So you can see on the screen um, with the lighting, you can sort of see that I've already etched the patterns into the paper. Uh, once you've done that, you are then going to use your Ginger Root PC1084 and start identifying where the darkest areas of the fur are going to be. So if you look at the reference photo, you can see that there are some sort of shapes and areas next to the real wavy bits that are darker in value. So we're going to put that on our page now and sort of use that as a guide to know um, how to work around the rectangular block to color in the rest of the fur. So I just want to identify my darkest sort of values first and then it's going to make it easier for me to fill in the rest. The nice thing about texturing in this way is that we don't have to worry about putting texture in with our colored pencils because the texture is already there. If you followed the pattern of the texture um, straight onto your drawing paper, you might have to hold your head at an angle to sort of see where that pattern is in terms of putting your darker values down. So I usually hold my head at an angle and then I can clearly see the etchings on the paper and then I can sort of flow or put my darker values down in the correct spot on the etchings on the drawing paper, if that makes sense. So that is all I'm going to continue doing with the ginger root. So this, this whole video is in real time, so you can sort of go ahead and do it with me. Remember, you don't have to be perfect because when you're drawing fur, people aren't going to notice if you're going to have subtle differences in your values um, or shapes because the smallest differences are, are really not going to be noticed except by you as the artist. So it depends on how much of a critique you are against yourself, but I am usually not too worried about getting the detail 100%. As long as I'm satisfied with the colors and the values, I'm not going to worry about getting pieces of fur not in the exact right spot or some shapes not exactly right. Things like that aren't going to bother me. I kind of like it when I have a lot of differences in my drawing as compared to the reference, uh, particularly fur and maybe even a slight, slight differences in color because that makes it unique to me as the artist. So try and um, change your mindset in that way that when you notice differences in your artwork don't critique yourself and be like oh I wasn't good enough to get it exactly right instead be like you know what that's the unique differences that make that artwork mine and only mine because no one is going to get those unique subtle differences in their artwork doesn't matter how much they try and do the same thing um as an example, actually, if you go and have a look at when I did the giraffe tutorial, a couple of you tried the giraffe tutorial, and I loved seeing how unique each one looked. Like, even though we used the same reference photos and probably used most of the same colors, each giraffe came out unique and different. And I love, love, love seeing that because it just makes it so unique to the artist and it makes it a one and only you don't want it to be exactly the same as the reference photo because then you might as well print the reference photo and have that up on your wall if that's what you want to do but the whole thing is that whenever you create an artwork there are going to be differences and those differences are beautiful so I love it when things come out differently I don't ever make myself feel down or unworthy or unable to create things exactly the same because why would you want to do that in the first place fair enough if you are doing a portrait you want to get it as exact as possible because people are more inclined to notice differences in portraiture than they are in animals so if you make subtle mistakes and stuff in a portrait drawing it can sort of make some things look different and it's a little bit more easy to identify those differences. So um, when I draw portraits, I usually really, really take my time 
And if I don't get it exactly right, it doesn't matter because most of the time people are going to look at the portrait and if they know that person, they are going to know that that is the person that you drew. And that is good enough for me. <laughs> I still had my unique touches in the portraiture and people change. Over the years, people change. So it's okay if those subtle differences come out in portraits and I'm not fussed about it. So I hope I can encourage you guys to also not be fussed about it because you'll enjoy your work so much more. Okay, I know that was totally off topic, but I am still continuing on with my ginger root pencil. So this is still a... Pre a I think I only use Prisma colors in this part of the tutorial. You don't have to. Um, you can use your swatches and sort of compare your colors with your polychromos and do the same sort of thing. You really don't have to be too too exact with this when it's when it comes to colors or when it comes to the um, the shapes and stuff. You can just go for it and have fun. It's so much fun doing textures like this, particularly in fur, because you don't have to worry about texturing. Like it's so fun to just automatically have the texture there um, by using the sculpt or the etching technique um, that I found. <laughs> so it's really good. The way I actually come across this technique um, is I used a drawing, a piece of drawing paper and I ended up throwing it away but um, what happened is that there were scratches on the drawing paper I must have drawn something on it before or on top of it before and I didn't notice and I started drawing on top of it and I was like oh I just cannot get the color into these scratches on the paper and it's infuriating and I was like and then I sort of just looked at the paper and I was like, you know what, that could actually be such a useful technique to use because if you have a scratch in your paper, it almost feels like it's impossible to get it to go away. So why not use that to our advantage and deliberately put the patterns that we want there because then it's too difficult to make it go away. So it sort of makes texturing such an easy technique to use. And I threw it away. I can't remember what I was drawing, actually. But I remember throwing it away and I remember thinking afterwards about it, thinking, wow, you know what, I could actually really, really use this. And then I started trying it out, the texturing, um, particularly on animals. And for highlights and stuff, um, even in the eyes, like the moist little highlights in the eyes. And I was like, yes, this is like the most, you know, awesome thing I've ever found. And I am going to do this forever because... I'm not fast like some artists, I don't know, I'm not sure, I didn't study art, but as far as I know, people are a bit iffy about damaging paper, so they, they think that texturing like this in your paper damages the paper, but to me, I'm not fast about it, it's still giving you such an incredible realistic look, so I don't care if I have a few scratches in my paper, I'm just going to use it to my advantage. So there are other ways of getting this um, texturing done, like you use your pencils to actually do the texturing, but it's, I find it way more time consuming and it depends on you in particular really, so it depends on what you want to do and how that will work for you. So all I'm doing now, now that I actually have the darkest shapes in, I am putting a very, very light color, a very light layer of the same color all over the rectangular block. So I'm not pressing as hard as I did for the darker shadows. I just want to give that light layer over it and then I'm going to clearly easily see the texture in my paper and then I can start adding more color to it um, as I go because now it's going to be so easy to see where I've etched those lines into my paper and the light value is just going to be a good base color for this drawing. So the next color I am going to come in with is my peach beige PC1085. So same thing, I'm just going to add this color in where I feel it's necessary. So I did look at my swatches to know, or I actually um, tested these colors on a piece of paper next to my drawing to see um, what values they are, how dark they are, because the casing of the pencil, 
99% of the time they are not the same color as the actual um, core of the pencil. So do test your pencils out. Don't trust the color on the casing because it's, it's very wrong. <laughs> So um, that's all I did and now I'm going to enhance those darker values. So now I can see where the darkest values are like because of what we did with the ginger root pencil and I'm sort of just going to make it flow a little bit further and just bring it out more to create more uh, texture and value because right now it just looks like a bunch of little dark values all over the drawing there isn't a sense of flow quite yet so that's what we're going to be creating with the next few colors so there's a lot of movement in the camera in this tutorial and i apologize for that but my dog honey decided that she wanted to lie where the camera stand was. <laughs> it was just convenient for her to keep moving closer and closer and also convenient for her to move a lot. So she kept bumping the camera. So I was sort of like readjusting and moving things around and trying to get her to move a little bit away. And then I do, I get her to move, but she only moves like five centimeters away from the camera and then she ends up turning around and bumping it anyways or moving closer and closer. They have all the space in the drawing room to lie on the floor, but they want to lie right by my feet. You can't, <laughs> you can't get upset with them for just wanting to be as close to you as possible, though. <laughs> so I'm just going to continue on doing this with the peach bays and just enhance those darker values the entire time. So I keep looking at my reference and like I said, I'm not worried about getting it exact, but I'm still looking for, you know, the right sort of flow and the right areas that are supposed to be darker and lighter. And I just keep working on them like that. Some of you um, might remember that a few tutorials back, um, I was saying that things might slow down a little because we're moving uh, interstate to New South Wales. So I'm currently in Perth, Western Australia. And um, we decided that we are going to wait for our house to sell first before we move because we initially thought, you know what, maybe we'll move and then, um, you know, the house will sell. And we had no idea how long this could take. So we already in the five month mark so we've already had our house on the market for five months it's crazy it's unbelievable and we've only had four couples view it within this short amount of time and the market is just so slow right now that we have no idea when we're going to sell so every time i'm like sort of getting ready for the big move um I can't, we can't really do much. We can't plan further. We can't look for new houses or anything yet until we sell our house. So it's very, very infuriating because we don't know when this is going to happen, but we're just going to be patient and wait and everything happens in its right time. So yeah, for those that were wondering why, <laughs> why I haven't said much more about the move or anything, it's because we can't really plan anything else until we sell our house. And um, we're really going to miss this house because we built this house two and a half years ago. Um, we built it and we designed it the way we like it and everything. So we really wish we could pick the house up and take it with us. But we can't do that, obviously. And we don't want to build again. We sort of just, we'd rather renovate an older place um, than build again because it's too long a wait, um, unfortunately. But yeah, so that's what's happening over here. And the reason we want to move is um, because we want to move closer to my partner's family. So he's Italian and his family is absolutely massive. They are such a big family. And most of them live in the area that we want to move to. They all have their own farms and they all... Um, they all are nice and close together and they're such a wonderful family. To, to them, everything is about family and it's so, so nice to have that close to you. And I, 
I know, like we've gone to visit a couple of times and I just love it so much. I'd be happy to live there. And it's so quiet and it's so nice. It's it's not the extreme buzz and chaos like you have over here. Even though we are quite far out from the city, we're about an hour just to drive from the city. Um, it's still very busy and it's Perth is so expensive as well. Everything here is just stupidly expensive. And um we're just ready to to have the quiet life and move closer to his family. And he works an hour and a half away from home. So he has to travel three hours in a day. And that's, the travel is just really taking it out of him. So we've decided that we're ready to move. As much as we love the house, we, we're ready to get away from Perth. And just the expense and the craziness over here is... We sort of, yeah, ready to move away from that. So that's the whole reason we want to pack up and go. So I'm very excited for it to happen. I'm actually very impatient, but we just have to wait. Okay, so now we're using the 10% Cool Grey. And this is going to be covering everything. So this is sort of like another base color. And we're just going to use this to enhance the entire rectangular area and make it darker so we are going to use a little bit of solvent um, on this drawing towards the end but not much so the colors we're putting down that's how as pigmented as it's going to get because we don't want to use too much solvent in when we're doing texturing like this because the solvent makes the color go into the indents of the paper um, so we sort of just want to use the right colors and this is going to be the lightest fur is going to be this color. So I am putting this everywhere. And then we can just keep building up from there and enhancing the color further. So that is why I'm using this color. And that's why I'm not too worried about, oh no, if I put solvent down, it's going to be much darker because usually solvent really brings the pigment and the color out. But we're going to use a very tiny bit of solvent with pr a practically dry brush so we don't have to worry too much about that. So the colors we're putting down are the colors that we're going to see um, to the end. It's not going to be any much more pigmented than that. If you're not sure what I mean, um, take some of your Prismacolor pencils and just like create little circles with it, um, just lightly uh, color in little circles and then take a paintbrush and dip it in um, odorless solvent um, or paint thinners or anything like that. But try and get the things that, try and get odorless because paint thinner is just not, not a very good thing to have open um, close to you and then uh, dip your brush in the, the solvent and put it on your pencil try not to have too much liquid on your brush and you will see how much brighter that color gets the pigment is just enhanced so much and the texture of the paper disappears because you're getting all that color in the texture of the paper and it makes it look really smooth okay so now I'm using the 20% French gray and I am just enhancing those darker values even more so I'm just bringing those values a bit further with this color and it's going to start creating a nice flow in the fur and it's going to start sort of adding it together so it's not just dark patches of fur that we see we sort of see a flow from dark to light and from light to dark and that's what adds a nice realistic touch to it So yeah, I'll just continue on with the French grey and enhance the darker values further so that it has a nice flow. <laughs> so the reason I have been doing the audio separately for some of these videos is because um, while I'm recording, the I've been having the aircon on because it's been freezing cold and the aircon is like right outside of my drawing room so it makes so much noise and then um, yeah there's just been so much noise and there's been so much construction going on around here that the back room just <laughs> I don't know it's just an area where everything can be heard um, as opposed to the front room where I'm sitting now and 
Yeah, so I thought, okay, you know what, I'll just put some nice music on or have some sort of something playing from Netflix. I usually like having documentaries on while I while I draw because I don't have to watch as much as I, I can also listen. And then, yeah, and then do the audio later on. And it's actually quite nice. I feel like I can have a sort of just a whole conversation. <laughs> So yeah, sometimes I need to do the audio separate, but I'm going to try and at least leave some sort of instruction on the screen at all times for um, those that don't necessarily have audio. I had someone comment on one of my YouTube videos actually, and she was grateful for me putting um, captions down the bottom. So it was my Patreon video where I explained what Patreon is about. I actually captioned that whole video. And she's like, this is so fantastic. I'm actually deaf and I'm interested in art, but it's so difficult to find something that is captioned very well. So um, thank you. So, I, I, you know, I never really thought of that, but it's probably, it would probably be a great idea to um, caption everything and take um, people that are deaf into consideration. I really never thought too much about that. So I'm going to... It's It's a bit time-consuming, but... I think I am going to start doing that as well and start captioning the videos and it's just going to make it easier. Easier for those who can't listen to it um, to just watch and read. So it is a nice thought having videos that are pretty much user-friendly for, for anybody. Um, and yeah. So... <laughs> So we can see now things are starting to flow quite nicely. Like the, the darker values aren't just like dark random values separated everywhere in the drawing. Everything's got more of a flow now from dark to light and light to dark. And the texturing is just so, <laughs> so cool. It just makes everything look so simple. And we really didn't have to do much except add values and colors. So yeah, I did have sticky notes next to everything with the colors and that down so that I knew what I was doing because I wasn't using the audio. So that's what you sort of see <laughs> me doing in the background there is I'm um, pulling the sticky notes off, which gives the colors. So now I'm coming back in with the ginger roots, the PC1084. And this color's got a very nice yellowish tinge to it. So I want to add that value um, in a little bit more so that it doesn't look quite... A, like white fur but it looks more like a, a beigey sort of light colored fur I don't want it to be quite as as light as white <laughs> so the white fur we use more of the gray tones and the cool tones um, to add value and then with this fur it's a it's a much warmer color so we're using more of the beigey warm tones in here so yeah just using the ginger root I just want to add more more color um, to the drawing, not necessarily value, just adding, adding more of those colors to give it more of that warm look. The table is moving around a lot here, so I apologize for that. Um, I know that sometimes if I keep, if I'm against the table, I do tend to make it move a lot, so I sort of need to sit away from the table. <laughs> but I obviously was not. I received, um, a nice postcard in the mail today from La Cree Fine Arts. So a, a couple of you also support Lisa on Patreon and um, her YouTube channel and her Patreon and everything is fantastic. So I like to support her because um, she's a great artist and I can understand exactly um, how great she is and how she wants to teach others to draw and I've learned a lot from her 
and I've spoken to her a couple of times and she's just such a wonderful person. So I just support her because I can, <laughs> not necessarily because I use her materials. Um, another artist I like to support is Ellen Brenneman. She uses India inks to do her um, animal paintings and her techni technique is just unbelievable. So she's just started Patreon recently and her tutorials um, are starting to get better and better as she goes. So I'd really encourage you to um, check out Ellen's channel as well. And yeah, I encourage you guys to support as many artists as you can. And it's just really, really good. I'm all for supporting other artists. If there's any artists that can sort of put me off of their work, it's artists that aren't willing to... Um, to share not not necessarily share their techniques but share their thoughts and ideas there are many artists that feel threatened by other artists purely because they think that maybe they'll steal things from them or that they they'll do the same things and those are sort of things that put me off of other artists because they're not as willing to embrace their art and share their their love for their art as other artists are because of the fear of, yeah, the fear of people stealing their stuff. <laughs> to me, I'm like, even if you try and draw the same thing as somebody else or paint the same thing as somebody else, it's never going to come out the same. And also, people should know what they are allowed to draw and what they aren't allowed to draw. I'm more than happy to have people copy my work as long as it is for them to learn and not for them to sell, depending obviously if they're using a reference photo um, that's purchased and one that's got, you know, is royalty free, then go ahead and, and sell it. That's fine. I am teaching art for other people to try and sell and um, to, to encourage you to start trying to make money from your art as well. Um, I don't think it should be if one artist makes money from art, they shouldn't share because then other artists are going to make money and then they're going to lose out. I really, really don't think it works that way. If people enjoy your art, they'll pay for it. Um, if people enjoy your personality and you as an artist, they will support you as an artist. So it's not about other artists being able to create and then you're like, oh no, I taught so many people how to do art this good and now I'm going to lose money because there's so many more out there that can do the same thing. That is the very wrong way of trying to, <laughs> trying to look at it. Um, okay, I can really go on about that subject, but I'm just going to stop right there. <laughs> All I'm doing over here is I'm using a dry tissue and I'm just rubbing everything because the tissue is going to lift some of the pigments and sort of spread it around. So it's going to give it a... Almost blended, but not quite blended. I didn't use solvent on this drawing. I'm sorry, I thought I did, but I didn't. And that was enough just using the tissue to sort of blend it around. And that keeps the texture there. So that's another technique you guys can do. And yes, it is really as simple as that. So I'm glad you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Or I hope you did. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.